So anyway, uh, I want to get into what I believe the Lord wants me to share this week. And I'm going to, again, start where I left off last year, which I know is ambitious because people have other things to do than think about what I ministered last year, all year long. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of you that weren't here last year. But anyway, real quickly, I just shared that the Lord showed me that when I got born again, it was my spirit that was changed, not my body and not my soul. And this was a major breakthrough because scriptures that say, you know, that you are the righteousness of God, I'd go look in the mirror and I'd think that's not righteous. And I'd look at my mind and my thoughts and that wasn't totally righteous. And because of it, I was just stuck. It was like, God, I can't understand the word. And when he showed me that it's not my body and it's not my soul that got changed, it was my spirit. And he showed me who I am in Christ and what I had in Christ. It totally revolutionized my life because God is a spirit and God sees me in the spirit and he relates to me in the spirit. And even when I sin and even when I fall short, even when I mess up, God does not change in his attitude towards me because he's a spirit and he's dealing with me in the spirit. And my spirit is sealed and sanctified and perfected forever. We talked about all of these things last year. So... <laughs> Anyway, I've never just continued a teaching from the year before, but that's what I'm doing this time. So anyway, let's turn over to Genesis chapter one. And if all those things be true, and if you were changed, here is one of the applications of this that just totally changed my life. I touched on this last year again. Uh, for those of you that could remember that far back, I touched on this, but I'm getting a lot more revelation on this. And even last, I think it was October the 4th, of last year, I was watching my own television program, which is strange. But you know what? If you were on television, you'd watch yourself too. <laughs> you would. Anyway, I was watching myself and I was teaching on some of these things and God spoke to me through me. It was really, <laughs> it was really weird. I was sitting there thinking, how does this happen? <laughs> but it just shows you that God can take anything that you say and God can amplify on it and you can get different things. The same people that are here tonight can hear me say the exact same words and some of you will go home and get different things out of it. But God spoke to me through me and it was awesome. <laughs> and I just want to share some things with you here that compliment all of this about who you are in Christ and how that God already loves us and has done all of these things. In Genesis chapter one is where God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given unto you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat and it was so, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So there's a lot of things in those verses, but here's what I was wanting to point out. And this is where I'm wanting to start. And I'm going to be dealing with this all week long, but this is really simple. So please don't discount this just because it's so simple. We need to get a revelation of this. And if you get it, it will really change your life. But Adam and Eve were the crowning jewel of God's creation. And there's many scriptures that say that. Contrary to what a lot of people are teaching today, you know, we've moved so far away from scripture and we are, uh, we've exalted ourselves and, and all of these things. And anyway, um, there's a lot of people that will put 
animals and the snail darter and all of this environmental stuff above everything else. And you know, I was just teaching yesterday on television about um, a, a godly man will even regard the life of his beast. And so the scripture in Proverbs talks about, you know, that a godly person uh, is kind to animals and stuff and we need to take care of the environment. I'm not talking about trashing it, but I'm saying that man was the crowning jewel of God's creation. And all of these things were created for his pleasure and for our pleasure, and we're supposed to have the dominion over them. Today, we see people that are putting animals and things ahead of people. You know, I just saw an ad this last week that showed these pitiful looking dogs that were just sitting there shaking and there was sad music and please help. And I couldn't help but think, I'd like to know the people that put out that ad. If they abort babies, then I got no place for them talking about, you know, pitying these animals. But there are people today that will pity an animal and do all of these things, and yet they don't respect human life. So anyway, without me getting off on all of that any more than I have, let me just say that we were the crowning jewel. We were what God created all of this for. And even though we were the focus of God's creation, He created us last. He didn't create us first. Again, this is really simple, but think about this. If God would have created us first, did you know it was the fourth day that he created uh, land? It was either the third or the fourth day, you can read it right here, that he created land. If he would have created us first, we'd have had to tread water for three days. And then if we would have been created first when there was land and all of a sudden God said, let there be trees who fruit is in itself and let there be grass and all of these things. We'd have had to been dodging all of the mountains and the trees <laughs> and things like this. You know, the reason that God created us last, it's very specific. It's because he created all of these things for us and didn't create us until he had already made a provision for everything that we will ever need. When Adam and Eve were created, they didn't come to God and say, God, I'm hungry. And all of a sudden the Lord said, oh, I'll create you something to eat. <laughs> no, he had already created. You know, in this verse, I forget the number here, but it says in verse uh, 29, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed and all of the fruit and all of these things to eat. God had already created this. He had already created the needs or he had already anticipated the needs of Adam and Eve. And before they ever existed, he created everything that they would ever need. They didn't get hungry and then have to go to God and God respond to them and provide food. They didn't say, God, I need to breathe. And he said, oh, I'll create air. He anticipated everything. And uh, I could spend some more time on this. I'll just say it and let it go. But he anticipated the needs of the entire human race. God has never created any more oxygen. He's never created any more food. He's never created anything new. The Lord rested. Right after this verse, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, the Lord rested on the seventh day. And when it says he rested, that's not talking about him being tired. It's talking about that it was complete. It was done. There was nothing left to do. And so he rested and immediately man entered into this supernatural rest that the Bible calls a Sabbath. Now I talked on some of this last year and I'm not going to go back over all of that, but Hebrews chapter four talks about a Sabbath rest. And many people are trying to keep a day and honor a certain day, which Sunday isn't even the Sabbath. The Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, but it's not the day. We now have the reality. The Sabbath was a picture and a shadow of something that was to come, is what it says, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We now have the reality, and the reality is resting in what Jesus has done. And that's what Hebrews 4 is all about. So man entered immediately into this completion that God had created. And when Adam needed something, he didn't need to say, oh God, I need this. God has anticipated the need of the entire human race for all eternity until he gets rid of this earth and creates a new one. And there is nothing that we can do that can 
you know, go beyond God's ability to supply. And God has already supplied it before we ever need it. Didn't get a lot of amens out of that. Many of you have never thought along these lines, but I guarantee you it's true. The Lord didn't wake up this morning and create a million new cows. He's never created another cow. He's never created another goat or a sheep. He's never created another tree. God does not create. He created in the beginning and then he rested. And it says in Hebrews chapter four that he that's entered into the Lord's rest has ceased from his works as God did from his. God is not creating anything. He has anticipated all of your needs before you ever had one. When Adam and Eve needed something, they didn't need to go ask God for it. God had already created it. And did you know that there was enough food on this planet when God created it that would have sustained every person who's alive now? There's only two people alive. And yet there is enough food for 7 billion people or however many we ever grow to. There was enough oxygen for the whole world. He's never created new oxygen. Somebody's saying, well, what's the point? The point is that God has anticipated every need that you will ever have. And when you come into a need, it's not a matter of going and saying, oh God, I need you to do this. And you pray and then you wait on God to respond to you. God has already supplied everything you will ever need you do not have to get God to do something. What you've got to do is labor to rest that God, it's already done. And that is a huge, huge difference. And what I want to talk about this week is uh, I've got a teaching entitled, You've Already Got It, So Quit Trying to Get It. <laughs> and did you know everything that you need from God, you've already got it. And it's not out there somewhere. This is one of the things in that book on prayer that uh, offends a lot of people. I don't mean to be offensive, but it really set me free because I used to take Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10 where Daniel's prayers were hindered for 21 days by the prince of Persia and Gabriel had to come. And so I would pray and break the powers over Minneapolis, St. Paul and clear a hole in the heaven so that our prayers could get up to heaven and stuff, and it finally dawned on me that I don't need my prayers to get up to heaven. God lives right here. That's the reason I bow my head when I pray, so I can say, Father, <laughs> amen. That was an Old Testament thing, but in the New Testament, God has placed inside of you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So when the doctor tells you you're gonna die, you don't have to go and say, oh God, I need you to heal me. The scripture says, First Peter chapter, uh, yeah, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes you were healed. It's already been done. God placed on the inside of you the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Let me just turn over and read some of these. I could quote them, but man, you need to see this. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse, matter of fact, the book of Ephesians is unique in the way it ministers because it's ministering from this mindset that I'm talking about. You may not have read it this way, but it's really unique because instead of asking for something and pleading with God to do something, it's praying that the people would get a revelation of what's already been done. We aren't headed towards a victory. We aren't fighting for a victory and Father, I'm gonna get here. We are coming from a victory. It was done at the cross. It is finished. And you don't need God to do something for you. What you need to do is learn how to believe and rest in what has been done and overcome your doubts and fears because God has already done it. And so the book of Ephesians is written from that standpoint. Just for time's sake, I'm gonna skip through some verses. But in verse one, or verse three, Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many times have you asked God to bless you? Or God to bless somebody else? The truth is you're already blessed. 
You can't get to be more blessed. You can't get God to bless you more. Now, you can walk in more of the blessings of God. You can learn how to receive it and cooperate and appropriate what God has done, but you can't get God to bless you anymore. You are already blessed with all spiritual blessings. In the next verse, verse four, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Let me ask you, if you were chosen in God before the foundation of the world, is that God responding to you? He's already chosen you. He's already blessed you. He's already done these things before you and I even existed. This is hard for us to wrap our little peanut brain around. And we think, how could this happen? But I don't know how God does it, but he comes by it honest, I can guarantee you. And he's blessed all of us before the world even began. He chose us. In verse five, he's already predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. In verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath, hath means past tense, it's already done. You're already accepted in the beloved. How many people are fighting and struggling and trying to earn acceptance with God? You're accepted before you were ever born. He accepted Jesus and any person who chose to make Jesus their Lord is accepted in the beloved. Did you know that this exact word that's uh, translated accepted right here, it's only used twice in the New Testament, this Greek word. And you know the other place it was used? Luke chapter one, where the angel said, hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. The only other time this word was used was talking to Mary that she was highly favored. That's what this means. You are highly favored. And some people in here right now, you know, Mac was talking about this, that you are condemned because you know that you've done something wrong and you're feeling condemned and you don't feel highly favored. You don't feel accepted. And you are in the process of trying to get rid of this sin and get rid of this problem and do this in order to earn God's acceptance. But you are accepted in the beloved, not accepted based on your performance. You're already accepted. God loves you. God is excited about you. And some of you think, well, I can't understand it. Boy, this goes back to what I was teaching last year. <laughs> that the, I, I couldn't accept that God loved me because I'd go look in the mirror and I'd think, God, I don't even love myself. I'd want this to change, that to change. I'd look at my uh, mental, emotional part and I was displeased with the way I responded to things and the fears and the phobias I had. But see, God doesn't see you that way. God's a spirit and he's looking at you in the spirit and in the spirit, you are a brand new person. Second Corinthians five seventeen. And God sees you in the spirit and you are highly favored. You are accepted in him. God loves you. He loves you as much. Man, put your seatbelt on. Hold on. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He's as pleased with you as he's pleased with Jesus because... Your born again spirit is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that was sent to live on the inside of you. And the Bible says in Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you say, well, I, I don't have Jesus living on the inside of me, then you aren't born again. If you are born again, you have Jesus. The spirit that you received at salvation is the spirit of his son entered into your heart crying, Abba, Father, it's as holy and pure as Jesus is. I'm not backing off anything I'm saying, but let me just put a little parentheses here, a PS. This goes right along with what Mac and I were talking about before the service. I just held a meeting with a man who taught all of these things, which I agree with 100%. But then he would say, therefore, I, this spirit who I am is the new me and my flesh, anything I do wrong is not really me. And so he took no responsibility for actions. He didn't do anything because after all, he was a new person in Christ and God saw him in the spirit. So it didn't matter if he acted right, did anything, he could go do anything. I'm not, I don't know him well enough to say that he was living in sin, but he was saying it doesn't matter. I live in sin. That's not me. That's like a person saying that I am, 
healed by the stripes of Jesus in my spirit. I've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead, which is all true. But then they deny that they have a physical body. So when the doctor says, you got cancer and you're going to die, they say, no, that's not me. My spirit man is healed. Well, that's absolutely true. Your spirit man is completely holy and pure, but you've also got a physical body and the thing's going to die if you don't learn how to get this power out of your spirit and into your flesh. And just because God has done all of these things for us, it doesn't, it doesn't manifest into the physical realm until we learn how to release what has been placed on the inside of us. And that has to come through the renewing of the mind and then renewing your mind and believing it enough that you act on it. And if you don't believe it and act on it, then this power that's in your spirit, it'll stay there. But you know what? You'll, you won't experience prosperity as Mac was talking about tonight. You won't experience joy and peace and stuff even though you've got all of this on the inside of you. And so you've got to recognize that even though you are highly favored, that you are accepted in the beloved, you need to get that out of your spirit and into your soul. You need to go to experiencing this love. You need to renew your mind and convince yourself that you are the beloved of God, that he carries his, your picture in his wallet, that he's got an eight by 10 of you on his mantle in heaven, that man, God loves you. You got to speak to yourself. Matter of fact, these very verses that Mac used tonight out of first John chapter three, right before the verse that he quoted, I think verse 20 and verse 18 and 19, it says, and herein we shall assure our hearts before him. See, there's a lot of people think, well, if I was right with God, I'd just know it. No, the scripture says you have to assure your heart. You are right with God. Your spirit has been changed. You are now a brand new person, but this mind is going to continue to function the way it was programmed until you reprogram it. And you have to get in and change the way you think. And you have to change the way you deal with yourself, the way you see yourself. And see, that's what these are talking about. You're already blessed. You already have this. You're already accepted in the beloved. I'm going to have to jump down or I'll never get to this verse I was headed to. In verse um, 15, he begins to pray a prayer in verse 15. And notice the way he's praying this prayer. Let me just say it to you this way, that if you were told that you're going to write down a prayer, you're going to be uh, praying for people 2,000 years in the future. And they're going to be reading your prayer. How would you pray? What would you write down? Again, because I've heard so many people pray, most of the prayers would be something like, oh God, just pour out your spirit. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, do a new thing. Oh God, touch these people. It would all be pleading with God to do something for these people. This prayer is all about, God, open up their eyes to what you've already done. The whole book of Ephesians is written from this perspective. This is really powerful. So remember that as we read through this. In verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Man, I could preach on every one of these phrases. I've meditated on this for 30 or 40 years and that these are really important to me. But it's not just the hope of your calling, it's his calling. Whatever God has called you to do is just a portion of what he called Jesus to do. Every one of us has a portion of his ministry. Man, that's awesome. It's not your ministry. It's his ministry. What is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? His inheritance isn't in heaven. We'll sing songs about when we all get to heaven. What a day that is going to be. Further along, we'll know all about it. Man, it's going to be awesome and people long for heaven and heaven's going to be a blast. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. But this says the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. You put this together with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and it says that we have been called to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You right now 
Again, see, you've got to understand your spirit, soul, and body. You've got to understand it's the spirit that's changed to get what I'm saying. But right now in your spirit, you have the glory of God in you already. It's not out there. You don't have to pray the glory down. You know, I love your praise and worship here. I really enjoyed it. But so many places I go, they're begging God to come. And oh, God, come and be with us tonight. It's just crazy. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet we're saying, oh, God, come. And then we pray, oh, God, go with us as we leave this place. What a dumb prayer. <laughs> I don't know if you guys pray that way. I don't mean anything bad by it. But it's just a dumb prayer. When he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and you ask him to go with you. You can whitewash that any way you want to, but you don't believe what the Word says or you wouldn't pray prayers like that. Man, we don't have to pray God down and we sing, oh, we got to get past the brazen altar and into the holy place. Man, we start in the holy place through Jesus. We're already past all of this and we don't have to go through the veil. So we've already got all of this. God's glory is inside of you. And somebody said, well, I can't see it. That's because you're only carnal. You're looking in the physical, natural realm. You are trying to see it in the mirror, see it in your thought life, but in the spirit, you've already got it. Now, it's not enough to leave it in the spirit. You need to get it out so that you can experience it and other people can see it. But it changes everything once you understand that I'm not trying to get God to give me His glory. I'm not trying to get God to give me healing. I'm not trying to get God to do something. God has already anticipated every problem, every need I'll ever have. And before I ever had the need, God has already created the supply. And all I got to do is figure out how to release it. It's so much easier to release something that you've already got than it is to go get something that you don't have. And then in verse 19, he says, and what he's asking that their eyes would be open to what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the word according to means in proportion to or to the degree of the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He's saying, God, open up their eyes to the power that they have. You have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Man, that's awesome. And somebody says, well, I believe I've got it, but it's just in baby form. It's in seed form. It's so weak. It's so, it's so frail. Your spirit is not incomplete. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. That's not talking about your physical body. This physical body's got to change and we got to get a glorified body. It's not talking about your natural mind because the Bible says we only know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, we will know all things even as also we are known. Your soul and your body aren't like Jesus, but your spirit, your born again spirit is identical to Jesus. It has his power. That's what he's talking about. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. But see people, when they get sick or something, oh God, would you please stretch forth your hand and heal me? And we put it on him. God, do something. And then we say, well, I prayed and I'm waiting on God to heal me. You aren't waiting on God to heal you. God's already healed you. He's already placed that raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Before you ever had the need, God had already created the supply. You already have the raising from the dead power. You already have all of the prosperity that you'll ever need. You've already got wisdom. It, you know, I skipped those verses, but it says he's abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence up here in the first part of Ephesians chapter one. You've already got this. And somebody says, man, I don't. I can prove it. I, I flunked my last test that I took. That's, that test only tests your little peanut brain up here. But in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16. In your spirit, you know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. 
We say, I don't know all things. I couldn't find my glasses and they were on top of my head. <laughs> but your spirit knows everything. And so it's not a matter of saying, oh God, would you please tell me what to do? God's already given you all knowledge. You have an unction and you know all things. Somebody says, well, what good does it do? As long as it's in my spirit, I need it out here. This is the reason that you pray in tongues. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse uh, 14, that when you pray in tongues, your spirit is praying. The part of you that has the unction from the Holy One and you know all things, your spirit is praying when you're praying in tongues. What is it praying? Ephesians, uh, well, there's many scriptures on this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you are praying the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery and all of these things. So you, your spirit that knows all things is praying the supernatural answer to whatever your problem is. And 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. All you got to do is just it, see, you rest in the Lord. Father, I have a need. I, I need to know something. I've got to make a decision. And in my natural self, I don't know what to do. But God, in my spirit, I've got an unction from the Holy One. I know all things. You've abounded towards me. I've got the mind of Christ. And you said that when I pray in tongues, that I'm praying the hidden wisdom of God. So right now, I'm going to pray in tongues and I'm asking for an interpretation. Amen. And you start praying in tongues and asking for an interpretation and boom, like that, creative ideas will come to you and you'll see things and and it's easy for you to think, oh, that's it. I should have remembered that or thought of that. But no, it was the Holy Spirit doing it. Amen. You know, I, uh, many years ago, uh, the Lord spoke to me about I was limiting God by my small thinking, and it's a long story. But I mean, that was in 2002. And since that time, our ministry has increased like 25 times as much. And we are seeing awesome things happen. And uh, anyway, during this period of time, I had bought a building and it was going to cost $3.2 million to renovate it. And at the rate we had been saving money over the last few years, I sat down and figured it out. It would have taken me over a hundred years to save $3.2 million. And so we were trying to take out a loan. And for nine months, we tried to take out a loan. And they told me next week, next week, you'll get your loan. And it never worked. And finally, after nine months, the banker just said, look, uh, it's been nine months. Let's start the whole process over. We need to go get a new appraisal and let's just start it over. And all I could see was it's going to be another nine months. And so I said, no, something's wrong. And I said, let me pray. I should have done this in the first place, but I didn't. I just was taking the natural way of doing things. And I said, Father, something's wrong. So I have this trail. I started walking in and I have a rock on my trail that's about from here to the back of this auditorium. And I've painted on this rock. If you don't, I will. Talking about if you don't praise him, I will. And so every time I walk by this rock, I'd say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> and before I could get that far, I started praying and said, God, I'm going to pray in tongues. And I know my spirit man has an answer and I'm asking you for wisdom. And I started praying in tongues. And before I could walk that far, the Lord brought back to me a prophecy that I'd gotten two years before. And in this prophecy, a man says, with all of this growth, you aren't going to need to take out a loan because you have a bank. And when he said that, I thought, what bank do I have? <laughs> and he went on to say, your partners are your bank and you will never have to borrow money again. And I was asking God, what's the deal? And before I got that far, that prophecy came back and I just stopped and said, God, are you telling me that I don't need to take out a loan? And I thought about it. I went and figured it out. It, I'd be over a hundred years at the rate we had been saving money. And you know, the scripture says in Psalms 15, four, that a godly man will swear to his own hurt and not change. And I said, God, if I say that I'm going to, do this debt free, I'm going to have to commit myself to this and I can't back off of it if it gets tough. I said, this could kill our ministry. Our Bible college was growing and we couldn't accommodate people and it would have choked the ministry. It would have stopped everything if we didn't get this done. And so I spent about a week praying about it, but the more I prayed about it, I just was absolutely certain 
that this was God. And so anyway, I made a commitment and I said, I don't care if they give me my $3.2 million tomorrow. I said, I'm going to do this debt free. I'm refusing a loan. And sure enough, the next day they said, you know what? You need more than 3.2. You need $4 million. We'll give you $4 million. And I said, you're a day late. <laughs> and I turned it down. And I refused to do it. And you know what? In 14 months, we got that $3.2 million and we built that thing and moved in. But you know what? I, it was because I believe, God, you've already given me wisdom. I've got the mind of Christ. I have an unction from the Holy One. I know what the answer is. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> I know it in my spirit, but I don't know it in my brain. It's here, and in the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray in tongues and ask for an interpretation. I just started praying, and I mean, boom, like that. The answer came. You know, if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Colossians 3.10 says, put on the new man, which after God is uh, renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You've got the mind of Christ on the inside of you. And yet we go through this life acting like people that just don't know anything and like, well, I'm only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. <laughs> One third of me has been renewed and I am a new person. And it's just like, Adam and Eve, when they got hungry, oh God, I'm hungry. He says, well, eat. <laughs> you know, again, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes because people mean different things. But I go into these churches and oh God, I'm hungry for you. Oh God, I'm desperate for you. And they just glorify their hunger and desperation. And I always say, if you're hungry, eat. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's here with you. It's like a person sitting at a table with a seven course meal in front of them and all they can do is talk about, man, I'm sure hungry. Well, then eat. <laughs> Adam and Eve, God had already provided everything and it's true, they probably got hungry, but if they did, it was their own fault. It wasn't because God wasn't supplying. There was enough food on this planet for seven billion people. There was no shortage of food but God didn't feed them intravenously. He didn't just by osmosis as they walked by, nourishment came into them. They had to reach out and take a banana and peel it and eat it. Some people would call that work. <laughs> well, I believe God's just supplying for me and I'm not gonna have to do anything. Go ahead and starve. God's not gonna spoon feed you. He's not gonna just make you receive it. He provides it, but then you have to draw it out. The scripture says it's God that works in us. Therefore, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God has given us everything, but you've got to do some things. You have to reach out and take it and say, thank you. And I tell you what, it takes a lot of effort to rest in what God has done. You know, right now we're in a building program and uh, we're just moving into a portion of it. It's a 150,000 square foot building and um, we're only moving into maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 square feet maximum. And we're gonna occupy some office space and some phone center space and stuff. And so the rest of the building, there's 50% there's of the building that's not finished. And uh, I've got to have $16 million just to finish that building and then $20 million to do the attached garage. So I need $36 million in the next 12 months above my $3.5 million I need every month just to pay my bills. So I need $6.5 million a month immediately. And you know what? I'm applying exactly what I'm telling you. This is what God spoke to me October the 4th as I was watching myself and I'd been praying and saying, oh God, I need some money and stuff. And the Lord was saying, hey, and he spoke to me through my own teaching that, hey, before I ever asked you to do this, I had already supplied the need. I've already spoken to people. I've already done it. It's just a matter of me resting in it, overcoming my doubt and unbelief and trusting God and praise God, it's all going to come in. Let me give you another passage of scripture. It goes right along with this. Once you see what I'm talking about right here, it, it's in everything. It's everywhere in the Bible, but it's amazing how often we think that us doing something 
made God respond to us. But truthfully, true faith is us just recognizing, God, you've already anticipated this. You've already meant the need. I've already got healing on the inside of me. I don't have to get you to heal me. I got to draw out the healing that's in me. Once you see this, it's just everywhere. Look over here in 1 Kings chapter 17. This is about Elijah. And boy, there's just, man, there's so many powerful things here. 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah just shows up on the scene and says, there's not going to be dew or rain until I say so. And he walked right up to the king that was killing every prophet of God. He put himself in the crosshairs because he had a word from God. And man, there's some great things. I don't want to teach on this, but this is really good stuff. <laughs> Let me jump down to verse nine. After he had already been at the brook Cherith and the ravens had been bringing him bread and flesh every morning. I mean, it was supernatural. I just have to say this one thing out of verse four and then I'm going to go on. But in verse four, God says, go to the brook Cherith. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. He didn't send his supply to where Elijah was. He sent Elijah's supply to where he told him to go. It's like when you play football. You don't throw the ball to where the receiver is. You throw the ball to where the receiver's going. If you haven't seen God's supply in your life, it's because you aren't all there. There's a lot of people who are saying, oh God, I know you're telling me to do something, but you supply the need and then I'll do it. No, you have to go and do and then you will find the supply. You know, we got Ken and Lori Balma down here and they run our Karis Bible College here and we're going to be mentioning that some, some this week. But when it comes to the Bible college, I have people all of the time that say, well, God told me to go, but I need to sell my house. I need this. I need this. I need this. And if God will supply these things, then I'll do it. And I say, that's not the way it works. You go and do what God told you. And when you get there is where your supply is. God didn't send the bread and the flesh to Elijah where he was. He sent the bread and flesh to where Elijah was told to go. And if Elijah would have stayed where he was, he could have died of starvation and from our perspective, we would have said, why did God let his man starve? God didn't. God sent the supply faithfully. He says, I have, notice in verse four, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. He had already spoken to the ravens before he even spoke to Elijah. And ravens could fly faster than Elijah could run or walk. One of the ways that Elijah knew that he was in the right place is because when he got there, the provision was there. The ravens were already on their way. And likewise, if God has told you to do something, he has always supplied. He has never failed a single person ever to meet your need, but you may never see that need because you just stay here waiting on God to provide instead of going and doing what God told you to do. The provision is there. I just put up a sign this week at our place that when you drive in, it says, welcome to your place called there. <laughs> And man, that's awesome. When you go and do what God told you to do, there's supernatural supply. But then after a while, the brook dried up and he told Elijah in verse nine, he says, arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there. His place called there changed. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Notice he had already spoken to this woman. Most people read this and think that this woman was just out gathering sticks. It was just happenstance that he just came across her path. Any old woman would do. That's not true. If you read in Luke chapter four, Jesus talked about this woman. And he said, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, but God didn't send Elijah unto any of them, but instead to a woman of Zarephath. This woman was chosen by God and he said, I have commanded this woman to sustain you. He had already spoken to this woman before Elijah even showed up. But here's something really interesting. He didn't send the woman to Elijah. He sent Elijah to the woman. And Elijah had to ask the woman for this provision. 
Well, God really spoke to me through this just recently. That you know what? He's already supplied my need. And I don't know about Mac. He's, you know, he's been operating in prosperity a lot longer than I have. And he may be further down the road than I am in this area. But it just, I don't like asking people to give in offerings. In the natural, I don't like it. And I realize that that's wrong. But I don't like it. And it really ministered to me that he spoke to this woman but he didn't send the woman to Elijah. He sent Elijah to the woman and Elijah had to ask that woman for what she had and make a demand on her. I could just imagine the newspaper headlines. Woman, I mean, prophet takes food out of woman's mouth. Death imminent. <laughs> See, that's the way people look at it. But you know what? The truth was he wasn't taking from this woman. He was giving to this woman. If this woman didn't have a miracle, she wasn't going to survive. She was going to die. And her son later on in this chapter did die. And if she hadn't have entertained the man of God, her son would not have been raised from the dead. Elijah wasn't taking from this woman. He was giving to this woman. He was providing her with a miracle. The headline should have read, Prophet saves widow's life. If what you have isn't enough for your need, turn it into a seed and plant it. And this woman was in a crisis. God had already spoken to her and Elijah went and made a demand on it. But the whole key to the thing is that God had already supplied the need before Elijah had it. God had already supplied this widow's need before she had it and she put Elijah and them together. God had already planned all of these things. And brothers and sisters, regardless of what your need is, regardless if it's financial, if it's relational, if it's physical healing or whatever, before you ever had a problem, God has anticipated it. Nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing catches God by surprise. I'm amazed at the prayers I hear people pray and I, I'll hear people come and they lay out the doctor's report. Oh God, the doctor said, and you read off everything as if God doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> Most people think that prayer is an opportunity to inform poor misinformed God of how bad your situation is. It's like you have this picture of God sitting at a desk in heaven and there's a million prayer requests on his desk. And man, you got to get yours to the top of the pile because man, you need it right now. And so you got to tell him how desperate it is. Oh God, I need it now. And you just start bartering and trying to impress God. It says in Matthew chapter six, Jesus said, your father knows what you have need of before you ask. Prayer is not an opportunity to inform poor misinformed God of your situation. Prayer ought to be just, Father, thank you. Thank you that before I ever had this, before the doctor ever found this, you've already provided healing. By your stripes, I was healed. That happened 2,000 years ago, and now I have the same power on the inside of me that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you, Father. It's a done deal. It's already done. And you go to praising God, and you build yourself up in faith by speaking the Word of God. And then by the time you get ready to ask your prayer, oh yeah, and the doctor said I was going to die, but Father, thank you, it's already done. You just go to praising God and it's no big deal. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> See, that's not how most people think. Most people, oh God, I need you to move. And if, and if he doesn't respond right away to you, well then go get the prayer chain and get a hundred people or a thousand people to badger him. And man, maybe he won't respond to you, but if enough people bother him, he will eventually do something. That's not what prayer is all about. Man, you know, the scripture talks about in first uh, Timothy chapter six, I believe it is that you have to fight the good fight of faith. Yes, sir. Our fight in the Christian life isn't with, you know, demonic powers. Sure, they exist and demonic powers work through people and Satan will speak to you, but all he can do is lie to you. He can't force you to do anything. And all really the whole fight is I'm going to stand in faith. Amen. I believe that before I had the problem, God has already supplied this need and I am not going to move off of that. By his stripes, I was healed and this healing is coming out and manifesting itself in my body. And you just have to fight 
to rest in what God has already done. You've got to get this attitude that I've already got it. You know, it's like Prego spaghetti sauce. You ever seen those commercials where they say, well, I want basil. It's in there. Well, I want this. It's in there. Whatever you want, it's already in there. Amen. <laughs> whatever it is that you need, it's already in here. Amen. You've already got whatever it is that you need. Well, I need wisdom. You've already got the mind of Christ. You've got an unction from the whole. Well, I need to be healed. By his stripes, you were healed. You have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, man, I need love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You've already got whatever it is that you need. You don't need anything except your mind renewed to what you've already got. On that teaching that I've got entitled, You've Already Got It, it's got a picture of a dog chasing his tail. <laughs> because that's what most Christians are like. Oh, God, I need this. And you've already got it. If you get it, you've already got it. When a dog catches his tail, he, guess what? It was already attached. <laughs> he didn't get anything new. There's nothing new that came out of it. When you see healing manifest in your body, that's not when you got healed. You were already healed 2,000 years ago by the stripes of Jesus. And I tell you, it just makes all the difference in the world when you quit trying to get God to do something that he's already done and start praising him that it's done. And Father, I don't know where it is. I need to see it, but it's here someplace. And I'm not going to quit until I see it manifest because you've already done your part. You know, an old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. If you just were determined that I know I've got it here someplace and I'm not quitting. You know, my wife and I, we started ministering right after we got married, 1972. And we pastored a church in 1973 in, in uh, uh, Seagaville, Texas. And we saw blind eyes open. We saw deaf ears open. We saw miracles happen. And at that time, I didn't know that another person had seen a miracle for 2,000 years. I'd never heard of a miracle. I thought that they all passed away with the apostles, what I was taught. It was before I heard of Copeland and Hagen, Copenhagen. <laughs> I'd never heard faith. I didn't know anything. But I just knew that I had what God said I had. It was in here somewhere in the works that he did. I could do also. And I didn't know what I was doing. But you know what? I laid hands on everything that moved. And eventually you're going to see something happen. And I started seeing miracles happen. And I'm telling you, it changed my life when I started understanding that I've got it. I don't know where it is, but I got it. I don't know how to get it out, but I got it. It made a difference. Prior to that time, I did things to try and get it, try and get God to move. And you know what? It is frustrating trying to make God move, <laughs> trying to force God to do something. I've been there. I've started all night long prayer meetings that never lasted past 11 or 12. <laughs> By 11 or 12, I was the only one left. <laughs> and I would pray and beg and call out for God to do things. And man, it just changed my life when I quit begging God to do what he told me to do. He said, you go lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And you go raise a few people from the dead and see some blind eyes open. You'll have all the revival you can handle. You don't have to beg for revival. God's already sent revival. Acts chapter 2, he says that this promise is unto you and unto your children and unto them that are afar off. That's us. As many as the Lord our God shall call. God poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and he's never taken it back. We see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit ebb and flow, but not because God turns it on and off. It's because people respond and then they don't respond. You know, when, when uh, Oral Roberts... Uh, started his ministry, he was reading scripture. The Holy Spirit was dealing with him about why don't we see miracles today? And anyway, this is a, a, you know, a quick summary of things, but he basically got to a place to where God basically said, 
I've called you. You do something. Instead of him just continuing to pray and asking God to heal people, God says, you start praying and ministering. And so Oral made a deal with God and he asked for three things. So many people in attendance, a certain amount of offering and at least one miraculous healing. So he rented this hall and before he ever got out on stage, he had the people count and there was exactly as many people as he said he had to have that minimum number. He took up an offering first before he did anything else and he had to have a certain amount of money to pay for that hall and the advertising and I think he had $5 extra and so then he preached his message and asked for one notable miracle and he saw one person heal. And, and, and then Oral started speaking and commanding the healings and all of a sudden a healing revival broke, broke out and people say, man, it was a great move of God. Well, it was a move of God, but it wasn't God who was stuck before. It was people that weren't doing it and somebody broke through and started believing that I do have the power and when I speak in the name of Jesus and when he did, other people got inspired and all of a sudden, many people started responding and we had the healing revivals and he's not the only one. There's other people that did this, but I'm saying that it wasn't God that all of a sudden chose to start moving in healings in the late 40s and 50s. God's been wanting to do it for thousands of years, but finally in the 40s and 50s, somebody responded to him and he started flowing through them. If you're asking God to heal you, you're going about it wrong. God, by his stripes, you were healed. You already have that power. What you've got to do is stir yourself up and get into faith and learn your authority and start commanding the healing power of God. In the third chapter of the book of Acts, Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer and they saw this lame man laid there and they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. And they didn't even pray a prayer. They didn't say, oh God, we know that we are nothing. We have nothing. We can do nothing, but you can do all things. God, stretch forth your hand and touch this person if it be your will for Jesus' sake. Amen. You'll die praying that way. They didn't even pray a prayer. They just said, such as I have, I'm giving it unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And they grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he went walking and leaping and praising God. Did you know that they would get kicked out of 90% of all churches in the United States for saying, I have it. They did have it. And you have it too. You have that same power that raised Christ from the dead. But the reason it's not manifest in most people is because we aren't operating from who we are in Christ. We don't know what we have. We aren't taking our authority. We're approaching God as beggars. Oh God, please move. And, and you cry and wail and you do all of these things. And if you just get sincere enough, maybe even oh, hard-nosed God will eventually have pity on you if you're really desperate. That's not what moves God. Matter of fact, God's already moved. You don't need to move God. He's not the one that's stuck. God's already moved. What he needs is somebody to stand up and say, such as I have, I'm releasing it in the name of Jesus. And you speak to your body. You speak to your finances. You speak to your problem. You talk to your mountain about God instead of talking to your mountain, instead of talking to God about your mountain. You take authority and there's very few Christians that are doing this. We are approaching God as, oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. And the moment you say that, you can do nothing because you aren't recognizing who you are in Christ. You aren't understanding it's already done. That'd be like Adam and Eve saying, oh God, I'm hungry. And they just talk about it. And oh God, feed me. God created the food, but he's not going to make it. He's not going to stick it in your mouth and make you eat it. Saying, oh God, I need air. You know, this one song that we sing, you are the air I breathe. It's a great song. I love the point that it's getting across that we need to be dependent upon God. But God, you are the air I breathe. Well, if, you, if he's the air you breathe and if you're needing air, breathe. <laughs> Instead of griping about how desperate you are, just breathe, just eat. Don't sing about it. Don't glorify it. Don't talk about it. Just breathe. Just eat. Find out who you are and what you've got and use it. 
Amen. I'm telling you, brother and say, everything you're begging God for, he's already done. Oh God, I need wisdom. I just need you to give me direction for my life. He's already, it says, in, while you were in your mother's womb, he had all of your days written out in his book. Now, it's not going to automatically come to pass. You have to cooperate, but he had a plan for you. Not every person. Matter of fact, very few people fulfill God's plan for them. But God had a plan for you when you were still in your mother's womb, Psalms 139. It's not a matter of, oh, God, show me, do something. God's willing to show you. We're just watching too much as the stomach turns on the television to be able to hear God. Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And we have to, we have to seek God. If you, if you seek, you find. If you knock, it's opened unto you. And we aren't seeking and knocking. We're just doing whatever comes easy and taking, you know, we're like water. We take the path of least resistance. We go to the lowest level, whatever is the easiest. I'm guarantee you, God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. God wants to move in your life. God wants you healed more than you want to be healed. But he's already done everything. He's already put it inside of us. And it's not a matter of us learning how to motivate God and get God to move. It's a matter of us moving into faith and taking our authority and making some things happen. So this is what I'm going to be talking about this week is how to just believe that you've already got it. How do we release it? What do we do? And stuff, and I tell you, if you can receive this, this has revolutionized my life. It's changed the way that I prayed. It changes the results that I get. I still don't see everything the way it should be, but I'm sure it's because I'm still in the process of renewing my mind. But I'm seeing a thousand times better results than I used to see. I know I'm on the right track. I'm seeing good things happen. And I would highly recommend it. God has already done everything for us. If you are born again, you've got everything that you need. All you need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be able to release it. And if you don't have those two things, then uh, we can supply that for you tonight. Amen. Amen. You can get born again. You can get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, if you don't have this ability to pray in tongues, I don't know how you make it. And if you have the gift of the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues, but you don't pray in tongues, no wonder, no wonder you're having problems. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than ye all. He was a Texan. <laughs> I speak in tongues more than y'all. He was talking about then the whole church all put together. Can you realize how much speaking in tongues that was? That guy just happened to write half of the New Testament. People wonder, how did he get this revelation? He spent three and a half years in the desert praying in tongues. He already had the word in him. He had memorized the Old Testament and he prayed in tongues and God gave him revelation in all of this. You've got a dynamo on the inside of you when you pray in tongues and sad to say, a lot of Christians aren't using it. Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 14, two through four, it says, when you pray in tongues, you edify yourself. The word edify means to build up, to exhort. If you're discouraged, if you're depressed, and you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you do not have an excuse. You may have reasons, but you do not have an excuse because you got a dynamo on the inside of you and all you got to do is start praying in tongues and boom, you start building yourself up and encouraging yourself. If you're discouraged and have the ability to pray in tongues, I don't have any pity for you. I have sympathy and love, but I do not pity you because God gave you everything you need to keep yourself encouraged and built up and you just aren't using it. Amen. I know some of you think, well, that's easy for you to say. It's not either easy. I've been through some tough times. I've been through times that I guarantee you I could have quit a thousand times over. There's been times that honestly my brain was going so full on unbelief that I started screaming in tongues at the top of my lungs for two and three hours until I went hoarse because I refused to allow my mind to dominate me. And I've had to fight this. I prayed in tongues one time, 17, over 17 hours straight without stopping. Man, I've, I'm talking about, I've used what I'm telling you to do and it works. I've labored to rest. 
There's times that you just want to say, man, this is not going to work. I need to go another route. And I've just decided that, you know what, I'm sticking with it. And it's working, and we're seeing awesome, awesome miracles happen. If there's anybody in here tonight who does not know Jesus personally, you need to receive Him as your Savior. Because everything I'm talking about tonight is dependent upon you being a new person in Christ. If you have not been born again, you may be a good person. You may believe that God exists. Big deal. The Bible says even the devils believe and tremble. Just believing that God exists is nothing that the devil hasn't done. You've got to do something different than what the devil's done, and that is you've got to commit your life to him and receive this salvation. And when you do, you become a new person in your spirit. If you haven't done that, you need to be born again. And Jesus himself comes and lives on the inside of you, and you become a new person with all of this potential that I'm talking about. And once you get born again, you also need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to draw this out. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. I tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift outside of just being born again that there is. It is awesome. You have to use it. It's not automatic, but it gives you power that is beyond yourself. If you don't speak in tongues, man, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need power. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need this ability to speak in tongues and to build yourself.